Okay, welcome back. Uh, in this uh, new module, we're going to be discussing a variety of topics related to antigen receptors or lymphocyte receptors, uh, those molecules which are capable of binding specifically to antigens. So this is going to include immunoglobulins like antibodies and B cell receptors, but of course also T cell receptors. And a big topic of this week's uh, discussion is going to be how do we make so many different antigen receptors? Um, you know, uh, we in theory are able of recognizing trillions of different antigens. Um, but, you know, if we encoded trillions of different antigen receptors within our genomes, our genomes would basically be entirely nothing but antibodies, uh, and we wouldn't have room for anything else like hemoglobin or, or neurotransmitters. And so uh, we have some really sophisticated ways that we've evolved to be able to uh, specifically recognize such a broad diversity of antigen types. And so we're going to get into the genetics of how that works uh, in a series of lectures this week. So we're going to start today by focusing on diversities of uh, the diversity of immunoglobulins. So uh, we'll start with antibodies and B cell receptors, although many of the um, things that we're going to talk about will apply to T cell receptors as well. So a big way that uh, we generate diversity in our lymphocyte receptor repertoire, and particularly for immunoglobulins, is by instead of encoding each individual uh, unique antigen receptor in its own gene, is we actually have a series of unique gene segments which we can recombine in all sorts of different combinations. Um, and in that way, we can sort of save real estate in our genome, but still encode the possibility for many, many different types of proteins many different types of immunoglobulins which are capable of recognizing then a diversity in, in different types of antigens. And so the way this looks is that um, we have uh, within our genomes a, a, a collection of segments that can be, as I said, combined in different ways. And so uh, if, we, if we're talking about immunoglobulins, remember that uh, immunoglobulins have both light chains and heavy chains. And since we're talking about the, uh, the diversity in different antigens that we're, we're going to recognize, remember that the part of the immunoglobulin that's going to recognize the antigen is the variable region. So we're looking now at the genome, specifically the part of the genome that encodes uh, the light chain variable region and the heavy chain variable region, the antigen binding region. So the major difference here is that the light chain variable regions in the genome encode two different types of segments, which can then be combined in different ways. A V segment, or confusingly, a variable segment, and this is different than the variable region. The variable region contains variable segments, uh, so they both are shorthanded as V. Um, and, but not only the V segment, but also a J segment, or a, a joining, junctional, whatever segment. Um, so variable light chains compose, are composed of a V segment and a J segment whereas the heavy chain variable region is composed of a V segment, a D or diversity segment, as well as a J segment. So the way this looks is that um, with, we have many different types of V segments. Only one is shown here, but we have a lot. Uh, and uh, that can be combined with uh, all the different types of J segments that we have. And those combinations together make a unique uh, light chain variable region in the final immunoglobulin molecule. And the same thing here for our heavy chain, we combine one V with one D with one J to get a sort of unique combination at the end. Um, so we're going to dig into that in a, in a lot of detail coming up. But the other thing that I want to point out is that um, light chains and, and heavy chains make up our antibodies. Um, but another thing that contributes to the diversity is that we actually have two different places in our genome that can encode light chains. And so we haven't talked about this yet. Um, but uh, there are two different kinds of light chain, kappa and lambda. Um, they do basically the same thing. You know, the differences are not all that important, but the only reason I bring them up here is that because we have basically uh, two different chromosomes which contain genes that encode immunoglobulin light chains, um, this is a, a set of extra diversity because we have segments in one place and segments in the other, which can then, uh, you know, so it's just more possible segments basically to make immunoglobulins out of. And so uh, we need to know that there are both kappa and lambda light chains. Again, functionally equivalent for the most part, they're just encoded on different chromosomes. This is somewhat analogous to the different types of heavy chains um, although, um, remember that the, the heavy chain isotypes um, are in the constant region, and so this does not 
uh, increase the overall diversity of our antigen recognition repertoire. Um, so, uh, you know, it's an analogous concept, but it doesn't actually uh, apply to the topic that we're talking about today, which is how do we recognize so many different types of antigens? Uh, whereas kappa and lambda light chains do increase our, the overall diversity in our repertoire. Okay, so we have kappa and lambda uh, light chains, and then of course light chains by themselves are not enough. We also have heavy chains. The heavy chains are also encoded in a different chromosome. So actually we have three different chromosomes which encode all the pieces of our antibodies or B-cell receptors, and so all the pieces need to be put together to, to make a functional immunoglobulin molecule. Um, if we look at these three different loci, these so spots on three different chromosomes, there is a lambda light chain locus on one chromosome, a kappa light chain locus on a different chromosome, and then finally a heavy chain locus on yet another chromosome. Um, but what you can see is that, so whereas, whereas before we saw there was just like one V and one J um, that we put together, what this uh, figure from your textbook is, is pointing out is that there are a bunch of different ones. And so within the lambda light chain locus, we see that we have a variable lambda or a V lambda one, a V lambda two, then a discontinuity showing that there's a bunch of DNA in between here, all the way up to about 30 variable lambda segments. So people have different numbers depending on their genomes and the mutations that they have. Um, but you know, most of us have somewhere around 30 different uh, v lambda uh, light chain segments that are possibly that are possible ingredients to our immunoglobulin repertoire. Um, you know, we also have something around four J segments in the lambda light chain locus. Um, so these up to 30 different V segments can combine with up to four different J segments. And so you can already see that that's gonna be somewhere around like 120 different possibilities. Again, just encoded by um, uh, only uh, 34 different segments. And so you can see how the math starts to increase quite a bit, um, the more of these segments that we have. Now, within the light chain locus, we also have the constant lambda segments. Now, remember that light chains have both variable and constant segments, and so the constant segments also need to be here, but remember that the constant part of the light chain doesn't influence antigen binding, so it's not a source of diversity. I keep saying that, but it's an important distinction to make. Within the lambda light chain locus, um, each J segment has kind of its own constant segment that it goes with. And so if this J segment ends up getting used, then the constant segment that's immediately downstream of it is also going to be used uh, when, we, when we recombine the final light chain that we, that we use in the immunoglobulin. That's a little bit different than what happens in the kappa locus. So in the kappa locus, again, we have around 38 different V segments. We have uh, five different uh, J segments in the kappa locus. But in the kappa locus, there's only one constant kappa segment. And so there it doesn't matter which J segment we use. It ends up, uh, they all sort of share a single constant segment that ends up being used. Um, that's not an important distinction, but uh, that's why um, you know, they look a little bit different in these gene segment diagrams that you have here. Um, but uh, the major difference between these two light chain loci and the heavy chain locus, of course, is that the heavy chain locus also has D segments, so somewhere around 23 D segments. Um, and so we can combine up to 40 different uh, V segments in the heavy chain locus with around 23 D segments with around 6 J segments. Um, within the heavy chain locus, and so uh, you can see that we can actually make quite a, a, a quite a high number of different possible heavy chain combinations. Um, and so uh, we're going to put one of these different light chains together. So we, we only have one light chain. So it's going to either going to be a lambda or a kappa, and we combine that with whatever heavy chain we make to make the final variable region of the immunoglobulin molecule. So let's look about how let's look at how this combination happens uh, in, in a little bit more detail. Um, so if we start with the light chain, just for simplicity's sake, we start, we're in the germline DNA. So we're in the nucleus, we're in the DNA, the permanent coding, you know, uh, information source uh, for all of these things. And so, you know, when a B cell, which is where we are, is in a B cell, when a B cell is born, when it's, when it develops, it contains all of the possible V, J, and D segments um, that we have innately, that we're born with. Um, but that 
that B cell needs to make one unique B cell receptor or, or one unique set of antibodies that it's going to make through its life. And so to do that, it has to pick just one V and just one J and just one D in its light and heavy chains. And so what it's going to do then is cut out all of the intervening DNA between whatever random V and whatever random J in the light chain that it chooses. I mean, you know, chooses, quote unquote. Uh, this is all a pretty much stochastic process. But what happens is that that intervening DNA is basically just cut out and so we just bring the V and the J together then um, and that when you cut things out of DNA that's a permanent process and so um, from then on that B cell loses all of that DNA so it can't go back and use those segments later um, when it chooses a V and a J it commits and so it has that combination from then on for, for the rest of its life course um, you know, the constant segment is also out here. You know, it's doing things which are not important for this lecture, but we do need it too. Um, but ultimately, um, we, for the light chain, we bring a V and a J together. We get rid of all of the excess segments that we're not using. Um, and so we call this process somatic recombination. It's a recombination of, of DNA in the germline. Um, but DNA is not enough to make a protein. The next thing we need to do is transcribe that into mRNA. Um, and so we transcribe this gene sequence into an mRNA transcript. Um, and then remember that uh, to make uh, functional RNA, we have to splice out the exons. And so um, we, we splice out all the non-coding parts of the genome. And, and in this case, that means we bring the constant segment uh, into the mix here. And so now we have a V and a J that make up the variable region of the light chain as well as the constant region of the light chain that's translated and ends up in our final protein. And so this is a really nice sort of schematic, I think, that shows you, you know, the original the gene in the DNA and kind of where it ends up on the final protein. So you can see, if you remember, that the, um, that the, the ends of, or the antigen binding end of the light chain is the variable region uh, and it's composed of our V and our J segment. And then uh, the non-antigen interacting part of the light chain, of course, is encoded by the constant, we call it the constant region, and it's encoded by constant segments. And so um, V and J come together to make the variable portion of our light chain. It looks pretty similar for the heavy chain. Um, so we start with um, all the possible V, D, and J segments that we have. The constant region of the heavy chain is bigger, remember, and so it has more segments, but um, uh, it's just out here doing what it does. Uh, we're, we're not, again, we're not focused on that for now. Um, but remember, we, we need to ultimately choose one V, one D, and one J. So D and J are recombined first. So this always happens first. We take a D and a J, we bring them together, and we cut out all of the intervening DNA. Um, and then, once we have a D and a J together, we cut out all the intervening DNA between the D and the J and whichever V we've chosen. So we end up with a final recombined gene that contains one V, one D, and one J all next to each other. Um, that's transcribed into mRNA. We bring the constant region to where, to where we want it. Um, and now we can make a functional heavy chain protein. Um, so you can see here where the, the D and the J are relative to the antigen. They're right in the, in the, um, the hypervariable region, which interacts directly with the, with the antigen. Um, but uh, you can see that the constant region is going to make up all the rest of the part of the antibody, including the FC portion here. Um, so um, again, the major difference here is that the heavy chain has a D region in its variable uh, in its in its variable region compared to the light chain. Sorry, has a D segment in its variable region compared to the light chain. Okay, so you know this process of somatic recombination under you know determines ultimately uh, which combinations we have. Um, and as you can imagine from this, we get quite a bit of different possible combinations of all those possible V, D, and J segments that we introduced. But how many exactly? Um, so let's dig into the numbers a little bit. So Every person is slightly different. As I said, we've all uh, accumulated different mutations in the course of our family trees and, and, and our evolution. Um, but for the most part, most people sort of have the following number of functional V, D, and J segments um, within each of the three loci that we've discussed. So, you know, almost all of us contain or, or possess somewhere between 34 and 38 functional V segments in our kappa uh, locus, somewhere between 29 and 33 functional V segments in the lambda locus, 
and somewhere between 38 and 46 uh, functional V segments in the heavy chain locus. And so uh, you can read the rest of them. Um, but uh, as you can see, remember that that uh, the light chains do not contain D segments. So we don't have any of those that they're only found in the heavy chain. Um, and uh, we do have some different constant segments, um, although remember that they don't influence antigen binding. So they're not going to contribute to the overall uh, number of different antigens that we're capable of recognizing. So if we take all of these segments together, how do we figure out what our total possible uh, number of antigens that we should be able to bind with um, all of the different combinations of immunoglobulin molecules we can make um, is then? So uh, let's take a, a sort of random example individual. They have the following number of functional segments in each of their uh, loci. So they have um, 35 functional V segments in the kappa locus and so on. Um, so, um, uh, whereas before we saw a range, this is one person and every person has some discrete number of functional uh, segments. So, um, if we think about this, well, let's just break it down by each of the parts of the immunoglobulin molecule. Um, how many possible variable kappa segments could we make, or variable kappa light chains could we make? Well, there are 35 possible V segments with five possible J segments. So this person is going to be able to make up to 175 different variable kappa light chains. Uh, if we if they make their light chain, or if an antibody comes from the lambda locus, it would be the same thing. 30 possible Vs with five possible Js, so 150 possible kappa light chains. Um, the light chain is not enough to make the immunoglobulin. We need to combine that with a, uh, with a heavy chain. And so the possible variable heavy chains are going to be um, 45 times 23 times 6 because we have that many V, D, and J segments. So as you can see, we can make quite a number of different possible heavy chains, uh, 6,210. So to make an immunoglobulin, we need to combine one light chain with one heavy chain. Um, so the um, possible unique um, variable kappa regions then, or kappa family immunoglobulins, are going to be the total number of light chains from the kappa locus combined with all the possible different heavy chains. So if we do that, we could make around a million different uh, a possible uh, kappa immunoglobulin molecules. Same thing for lambda. We take the total number of light chains we can make from the lambda locus, multiply it by all the different heavy chains we could make, and it's also around a million, essentially. Um, so our total, then, theoretical combinatorial diversity um, is going to stem from only 149 gene segments. So we add all these numbers together, we're going to get 149. So in our genome, we're only making room for 149 gene segments, but out of that, the total number of unique immunoglobulin molecules that in theory we could make is actually 2 million. So we increase the number of possibilities quite a bit by using somatic recombination. Um, however, I said at the beginning of, of this lecture that we are capable of recognizing more like trillions of different antigens, and so that's a lot more than two million. So as we'll see, combinatorial diversity is not enough to explain the entire diversity in our, uh, in our antigen binding repertoire. And so in uh, the coming lectures, we're going to talk about the other ways that we introduce diversity into the repertoire. Um, so uh, combina combinatorial diversity is a good start, uh, but there are other things that, that we'll need to, to talk about. Uh, to sort of get up to that to that trillions number that I mentioned, um, but before we do that, let's let's close this and summarize our initial discussion of immunoglobulin diversity. So, uh, immunoglobulin immunoglobulin variable domains are encoded again by discrete gene segments. Each immunoglobulin does not have its own gene the way many other molecules do. We have different segments that we combine in different uh, combinations, essentially, um, to make all of the different possible immunoglobulin molecules that we have. So remember that the light chains are encoded by a V segment and a J segment, whereas the heavy chains are um, encoded by a V, a D, and a J. Again, the variable regions of these chains. These segments are recombined to make unique combinations, as I said. So in the light chain, a V and a J segment is brought together, and then the constant region is added to that at the end. Whereas in the heavy chain, first we combine D and J, and then that DJ segment is combined to a V um, before finally adding the constant region at the very end.
VDJ recombination uh, promotes what we call combinatorial diversity. So um, uh, this is one source of diversity in our antigen binding repertoire is all the different possible combinations of V, D, and J segments. And so as we saw in our example, somewhere around 150 functional gene segments gives us around 2 million, 2 times 10 to the 6, different combinations. However, the predicted total uh, immunoglobulin diversity that we have is somewhere more like 10 to the 13. So clearly we have a lot of ground to make up. Um, so combinatorial diversity is not quite enough on its own. Um, in coming lectures, we'll talk about what makes up the difference. So stay tuned for that.